My name is Martha Nolan, and I'm the Senior Policy Advisor for Healthy Women, a women's health online resource dedicated to educating women to make informed health decisions, advocate for themselves, and prioritize health and wellness. Thank you so much for joining us today to hear from the leading experts about the importance of adult vaccines and improving access to vaccines in all communities. As a reminder, today's briefing is being recorded and we will send a link of the recording to all who registered. While the conversation about vaccines is not a new one, the COVID-19 pandemic has brought lots of media attention, both positive and negative, to vaccines, impacting people's attitudes and beliefs about adult vaccines that are hurting your health and the economy as a whole. As experts have long noted about, uh, long noted, along with safe drinking water, the development of vaccines that prevent illnesses and diseases like measles, polio, HPV, and more are among the most significant medical developments of the 21st century. Vaccines have changed the world, saving close to 6 million lives every year and extending life expectancy across the globe. Yet since the pandemic, the focus on vaccines has been less on how much they advance human health and more on whether or not they are safe, effective, and basically worth the risks potentially involved. So today we're gonna to learn about adult vaccines, the very real impact of vaccine hesitancy, and the implications of accessibility issues and health disparities on vaccination rates, community health, all of which cost our country billions of dollars each year in additional medical costs and lost productivity. To help us understand these issues, we brought together medical experts who've been working in the trenches on vaccines and related issues for a very long time. But first I'd like to introduce our congressional host, Congresswoman and Dr. Kim Schreier. Congresswoman Schreier is the first pediatrician elected to Congress and is currently serving in her third term. She has been a champion in advocating for vaccine affordability and accessibility. Notably, notably last Congress, Congresswoman Schreier co-sponsored the Prevent HPV Cancers Act which among other things would have expanded HHS's activities related to you know, educating healthcare providers and the public about HPV, its association with certain cancers and the importance of HPV vaccine. Representative Schreier. Dakota, if we could get a little volume, that would be excellent. Thank you. <laughs> you can take yourself off mute. We should be good. About vaccines, which of course are near and dear to my heart as a pediatrician, it is one of the most important things that we do is preventing uh, diseases that previously were life-threatening um, or disabling horrible diseases. And I think what's happened over time, I mean, certainly in my experience as a pediatrician, is that we've seen an increase in vaccine hesitancy as people have uh, forgotten what these diseases were and what they did. And so really, instead of focusing on the cost-benefit analysis, um, really the focus is just on the, the cost or the side effects or worry about the vaccine. And so it has been really important in my experience as a pediatrician to sit down and have conversations with parents, um, answer questions, listen to concerns and address them, but also to put that in the context of the fact that we back down on vaccination rates, all these diseases are still there and will resurface with very few exceptions. I mean, we just saw polio in the United States of America, in New York. And when you see one case of paralytic polio, it means there's a whole bunch more asymptomatic polio uh, going around. And so um, vaccines have been one of my biggest priorities in Congress. One of, in fact, my first bill, I worked with the American Academy of Pediatrics and the CDC uh, to fund a project to address vaccine hesitancy, to really meet the moment uh, and address some of the anti-vax rhetoric online with the fierceness um, that they have to kind of take back that narrative. And boy, did that get uh, new life in the age of COVID. Um, unfortunately, because of COVID and politicization, um, 
and a lack of understanding of science and medicine, vaccines somehow became a political football and very controversial. And we lost hundreds of thousands of lives unnecessarily because um, people chose not to get a vaccine to prevent COVID and died because of that. And what we're seeing now though, is that this questioning of legitimacy of the COVID vaccine is now translated to overall questioning, which is showing up in pediatrics clinics where parents are now second guessing a need to get vaccines that have saved so, so many lives and that are safe and effective. And so this is gonna require one-on-one uh, -on -one conversations with pediatricians, pediatricians listening, understanding, empathizing and answering and giving parents the time to digest that information and come back for the next appointment to continue the conversation. And it's gonna be a hard one to pull out of. And I sure hope that with any future public health challenge, we can unite as a country, uh, follow the science and help one another. I wanted to touch on one other thing since I'm speaking with healthy women, which is about adult vaccinations because um, we have a program called Vaccines for Children that uh, makes vaccinations uh, available free to, uh, to children who don't have another way of paying for them. And I think we need the same thing for adults. Um, once, once people have Medicare now, thanks to a bill that we just passed several months ago, vaccinations for Medicare recipients are now all free. So the shingles vaccine, pneumococcal vaccine, those are now free. But we've got this period of time in between childhood and adulthood, and I'm thinking of things like the human papillomavirus vaccine that uh, is approved for adults uh, to prevent cervical cancer. I'm thinking about the pneumococcal vaccine uh, to prevent pneumonia in people who are higher risk. Um, and I'm thinking about the shingles vaccine that's recommended, I believe, for people 50 and up. Again, I'm a pediatrician, so this is a little bit out of my wheelhouse, but um, we need to make sure that people can pay for those vaccines because they are expensive. They are also life life-saving, uh, disease-preventing tools that I want everybody to have equal access to. So thank you for having this conversation with me, and I will continue to partner with you to expand access to vaccinations, to make them affordable, and also to be able to set the record straight. And as a pediatrician in Congress, uh, have frank conversations and education so that people understand uh, the importance uh, of getting vaccinated. So thank you for having me today and best wishes to all of you. Thank you, Representative Schreier, for your leadership on this very, very important issue. I am pleased to introduce now our expert panel. We have Dr. Sonali Kochar, Clinical Associate Professor in the Department of Global Health at the University of Washington, Seattle, who has over two decades of leadership experience for global vaccine for infectious diseases research and development and serves on advisory committees for WHO, Gavi, and others. Dr. Robert Hopkins, Professor of Internal Medicine and Pediatrics and Chief of the Division of General Internal Medicine at the University of Arkansas for Medical Sciences. He is also the current chair of the National Vaccine Advisory Committee to the Department of Health and Human Services. And Dr. Chizoba Winodi, Associate Scientist at the Don Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health and a public health physician who serves as the Nigeria Country Director at the International Vaccine Access Center. After remarks, we will have a Q&A in session, so please feel free to put your questions in the Q&A box and we will ask them at the end of the remarks. And now I'd like to turn the program over to our first speaker, Dr. Kochar. Thank you, Martha. So I'll be speaking about the vaccine benefit risk assessment. Next slide, please. So vaccines have numerous benefits, including health, social, and economic benefits. In terms of the health benefits, vaccines decrease infectious disease, morbidity, and mortality. Uh, we know that vaccines prevent more than 25 life-threatening diseases and prevent 5 million deaths per year. And potentially uh, another 1.5 million deaths could be prevented uh, you know, if people just got the vaccines done. 
In the US, among the annual birth cohort, vaccinating, uh, you know, vaccinated with nine vaccines against 14 diseases, nearly 17 million cases of disease and 31,000 deaths are prevented. And, you know, uh, uh, some vaccine may not prevent infection, but a much milder disease course follows. We saw that with COVID-19, rotavirus, pertussis, and varicella. Vaccines help in eradicating infectious diseases. We've seen that with smallpox around the world and uh, wild-type poliovirus um, in a number of countries. They prevent some cancers. Uh, for example, chronic hepatitis B infection can lead to liver cirrhosis and liver cancer. And the hepatitis B vaccine offers 98 to 100% protection against hepatitis B infection and subsequent development of cancers. Similarly, HPV vaccine is responsible for over 90% of anal and cervical cancers, vaginal and vulvar cancers, cancers of the penis and oropharynx cancers. And the HPV serotype 16 and 19 carry a high risk for cervical cancer, which is the fourth most common cancer globally. So HPV vaccine lead to a 87 to 90% decline in the incidence of cervical cancer, and they reduce oral, vulval, vaginal, and anal infection and the subsequent development of these cancers. Next slide, please. Vaccines induce herd immunity. So in addition to the direct protection that vaccine recipients get, uh, you know, when a sufficiently high proportion of the population is vaccinated, then the transmission of the infectious agent is also halted. And this helps protect you know, those who might be too young or too immunosuppressed to receive vaccines. So the vaccines would have the direct benefit and also the indirect benefit uh, of protecting uh, uh, the populations when the high coverage is reached. We've seen this with vaccines against rotavirus, hemophilus influenza, streptococcus pneumonia, et cetera. Vaccines reduce secondary infections that complicate vaccine uh, preventable diseases. So infections with pathogens, especially viruses, can predispose to acquisition of other bacterial infections. For example, the influenza virus infection is uh, frequently uh, complicated by bacterial pneumonia and acute ear infections. And measles eliminates the immune memory, so it leaves the measles survivors more susceptible to all infectious diseases that they developed immunity to. And it can take up to three years for immune recovery to take place. So vaccines can prevent these secondary complications too. Vaccines prevent antibiotic resistance. Uh, so by reducing the need for antibiotics, vaccines can prevent the prevalence uh, and hinder the development of resistant strains. We've seen this with vaccines against typhoid, for example. They can prevent primary infection, of course, but also prevent the uh, development and spread of multi-drug resistant strains. Next slide, please. In terms of the social impact, uh, equity of healthcare uh, um, is a huge uh, role that vaccines have. We know that the underprivileged are disproportionately infect, uh, affected by infectious diseases because of uh, poor hygiene and sanitation, poverty, overcrowding, malnutrition, and poorer access to health care. So vaccines provide the poor with improved health outcome equity, uh, you know, and we can measure this by undefined mortality rates and other rates. Empowerment of women. So with vaccines, we know that more children will survive to adulthood and lead healthy and productive lives. So women can have fewer children, they can spend more time on their children's education and development, and they can also contribute to the workforce. Vaccination of pregnant women has a threefold effect. It helps to protect pregnant women, it helps protect their fetus, and also infants younger than six months of age who are too young to be vaccinated. And the threefold uh, you know, protective effect we've seen with different vaccines, including pertussis, tetanus, influenza, COVID-19. And we have uh, new vaccines like RSV vaccine for pregnant women, which will probably be introduced this year, and uh, group B strep vaccines coming down the pipeline. And when women have the information autonomy to make health-related decisions for their children, then uh, childhood immunization rates improve. Next slide, please. Vaccines also impact life expectancy. Uh, you know, there are imp important costs for increased life expectancy around the world. Elderly go through immune dysfunction associated with age, which results in an increased incidence and severity of infectious diseases. So the older persons are offered vaccines to prevent infections with high morbidity and mortality. This includes herpes zoster, pertussis, pneumococcus, and influenza vaccine. And in a globally interconnected world, free travel vaccines provide protection and prevent the spread of diseases. Next slide, please. 
In terms of the economic uh, impact, the vaccines are highly cost saving. Uh, the cost effectiveness analysis of vaccines show that they're significantly worth the investments with most programs costing less than $50 per life gained. And this is less than even the cost of preventing diseases like hypertension. The return on investment in vaccines is estimated for every dollar spent is estimated to be $54. In the US, the estimated uh, childhood uh, immunization cost of $8.5 billion is offset by $63.6 billion in uh, disease-related averted costs. And we see this, uh, you know, the same uh, impact in LMICs. Uh, for example, in 94 LMICs, investments of 34 billion for immunization programs resulted in savings of 586 billion from direct uh, illness costs and 1.53 trillion for broader economic benefits. Uh, in terms of productivity gain, we know that healthy children would have better uh, school attendance and cognitive performance. And so this would lead to better educational attainment. And if they had visual impairments, say from measles or hearing loss from mums, rubella, or pneumococcal infection, or cognitive defects suffering from these infections, then they would require educational support and remedial input. And bear in mind that this, uh, you know, this kind of educational support would just not be available in most LMICs. So healthy and economically successful populations can invest more money in the future for education or through savings, uh, and this would impact economies globally. Next slide, please. And vaccine minimize the impact on the family because, of course, illness results in loss of productivity and pay for the duration of the illness and for the recovery period. Uh, so childhood illnesses result in parents taking time off from work to care for the child. So in seven European countries, for example, we saw that one parent or carer is required to take time off for work, uh, you know, in 39 to 91% of rotavirus gastroenteritis cases. And similarly for adults who get infected, uh, you know, they have to take considerable time off from work. And this has a considerable uh, impact on the family. Next slide, please. So this is just to give you a snapshot of the vaccines recommended for adults in the US. And you see that there are a number of vaccines which are now recommended for adults. Next slide, please. So now vaccine risk benefit assessment. Vaccines are administered to healthy people for the prevention of disease while drugs are used to treat or control disease in sick uh, people. So a much higher level of risk is acceptable for a drug compared to a vaccine. So most vaccines, in fact, are much safer than drugs. The data must show that the vaccine benefits measurably outweigh any potential risk for people who are recommended to receive the vaccine. The benefits could include you know, reducing death, uh, reducing hospitalization, preventing severe disease, and other benefits. And the benefit risk profile for each vaccine is assessed constantly during its duration of use. And a similar uh, you know, balance, uh, benefit risk analysis is also done for drugs. So only if a vaccine has a favorable benefit risk profile does the National Regulatory Authority grant a license uh, for the vaccine, allowing it to be used by the public. At the time of licensure, then uh, post-licensure surveillance activities are put in place to constantly monitor the vaccine safety and disease epidemiology. Uh, to ensure that there's reliable, up-to-date information because the information goes into the benefit risk assessment. And the vaccine safety assessment is exhaustive and begins you know, at the non-clinical evaluation stage of the individual components of the vaccine. It continues throughout the clinical development phase and through the entire duration of the vaccine, including post-approval. So the benefits of the vaccine have to always outweigh the risk in order to show that the uh, vaccine uh, can continue being used in the public. Next slide, please. So the risk evaluation of the vaccine includes, you know, it's, uh, the safety evaluation of the vaccine is done on a constant basis and it's very uh, thoroughly done. We, uh, you know, we look for the probable mechanism and underlying causes of any vaccine reactions, the preventability, predictability, and reversibility of the risk of vaccine reactions, the risk associated with alternative vaccine that protect against the same, uh, same disease, and the risk associated with not vaccinating. And the prescribing information book uh, leaflets are then regularly updated with the latest information to inform the healthcare provider and vaccine recipients about the most uh, recent assessment of the risks and benefits of the vaccine and any adverse event following immunization. So an adverse event following immunization or AEFI is an untoward medical occurrence 
which can follow, uh, you know, uh, immunization, but it does not necessarily have to have a causal association with the vaccine. It's not necessarily the vaccine actually causes the adverse event. The adverse event may occur coincidentally after immunization and be falsely attributed to the vaccine. For example, we saw that the incidence of sudden infant death syndrome peaks around the age of early childhood immunization. And for a number of years, it was thought that, uh, you know, uh, SIDS was associated with immunization, but when uh, uh, you know studies were done, this, they were found to be no association at all. And the evaluation of AEFI is constantly done by gathering safety data, analyzing the data for signals, determining if the signals impact the benefit risk profile of the vaccine, and taking appropriate actions. So it's very important to have a knowledge of the background rates of the disease and death, particularly the age-specific uh, disease incidence rates. So to, uh, you know, this allows us to determine if there's a coincidental event or we actually see uh, a safety signal that then must be investigated. For example, pregnant women, you know, regardless of whether they receive the vaccine or not, will still have preterm births. They will still have, uh, you know, spontaneous abortions, unfortunately. And so we need to determine whether this is just a coincidental event or it's actually related to a vaccine that's been given. And unfounded vaccine concerns have included over the years you know, anything from autism, diabetes, multiple sclerosis, or vaccines overwhelming the immune system, and they've all been found to be uh, completely unfounded. Next slide, please. And there's this thought that, you know, natural infection is, uh, is better than vaccination. But, you know, looking at a common condition like measles, you, so, you see that measles infection causes pneumonia, diarrhea, inflammation of the brain and spinal cord, uh, you know, chronic and progressive brain inflammation and death. Um, and, you know, the brain inflammation, for example, is always fatal. And with the vaccine, you see uh, none of these uh, adverse events occurring. Uh, so it's, you know, it, it is a complete fallacy to think that natural infection is better. Next slide, please. Similarly, for pneumococcus uh, in adults, uh, you know, the infection can lead to meningitis, leading to death, pneumonia, sepsis leading to death, and you see none of this with the vaccine. Next slide, please. So the factors to consider for vaccine decision-making include the policy recommendation, because these recommendations are really taking into account the latest data that's coming in, and we're very fortunate to have committees like uh, ACIP, um, you know, functioning to the highest international standards and really, um, you know, making policy recommendations that are, uh, are taking into account the most available data. It's going to have discussions with healthcare providers, vaccine effectiveness, vaccine risk, cost, and protection duration. And individual health conditions with increased vulnerability to infection. This includes, um, uh, you know, conditions like uh, pregnancy, immunocompromised state, extremes of age, uh, healthcare, uh, you know, pr uh, profession like healthcare workers. Uh, you know, so these populations should definitely get their vaccines done. So in conclusion, vaccines are one of the most effective interventions against infectious diseases and provide cost-effective long-term protection. Most vaccines are safer than therapeutic drugs, and data for show that the vaccine benefits measurably outweigh any potential risk for people who are recommended to receive the vaccine to allow the vaccine to be used. Thank you, Martha, and uh, over to Dr. Hopkins. Thank you very much, Dr. Kochar. Good morning. I'm honored to join my colleagues and spend a few minutes with you at this Healthy Women Briefing on Adult Vaccines. Next slide, please. Immunization occurs at the most local of all levels. One person received a vaccine. That's where the first direct benefit occurs. Societal benefits ensue with the vaccination of population, which results in more people staying healthy and carrying out their daily family, school, and work lives. We live in a global society and infectious diseases do not respect borders. If we don't relearn this with influenza every year, we have been thoroughly reminded by the COVID-19 pandemic over the last three years. Even now in 2023, at least one in three deaths worldwide is due to infectious diseases. Not all of these diseases are vaccine preventable, but current estimates are that 4 million childhood deaths are prevented annually by vaccination despite the fact that over one in five of these children have no access to essential vaccines, and global immunization coverage dropped to 81% in 2021, the lowest rate in over a decade. In the United States, we continue to see many thousands of adult influenza and pneumococcal infections and hospitalizations every year, and thousands of deaths. 
many of which could be prevented by higher vaccination rates and the use of more effective vaccines. While no vaccine reaches the goal of complete safety or perfect safety, the side effects of vaccines are thoroughly assessed prior to approval and in a longitudinal way after authorizations. All of our current vaccines are far safer than infection with the diseases they're designed to address, as Dr. Kochar has outlined. Next slide, please. The first goal of immunization is to reduce the risk for severe disease, and the second is to reduce the risk for infection. If a large enough proportion of a group is, in, is vaccinated, then the third goal, reduction in transmission of the, of the infectious agent within the community, what we term community or herd immunity, may be achieved. In other words, sustained disease transmission doesn't occur. And this even provides protection to unimmunized persons because there are enough immune ones in the population to stop transmission. When or if community immunity develops depends on the characteristics of the infectious agent, as well as the vaccine. Next slide, please. This table shows the decline in frequency of 10 vaccine preventable diseases since we started using routine vaccination in the United States. It's important to note that we've seen over 50% reduction in each of these, and that more recent vaccine introductions, such as the newer pneumococcal conjugate vaccines and expanded recommendations for hepatitis B and A vaccines will likely result in even further reductions in the disease burden to our society. Next slide, please. People do not make decisions to vaccinate their children or to be immunized in a vacuum. Trust is a critical component. Trust of the vaccine, the provider, trust of the recommendation. Communication is critical. What the individual has heard or seen about the vaccine and how strongly the provider recommends it. And context. Is it difficult to get the vaccine? Are there out-of-pocket costs? Are there beliefs or actions from their family or other co close contacts that inform their decision? These are all important factors in individual decisions. How well a vaccine will protect an individual depends upon the vaccine, when it was given in relation to exposure, and how well the patient's immune system responds. Many of our vaccines require people to receive booster doses to sustain their immunity. In essence, the immune system needs a reminder to stay protected against the vaccine preventable disease. And unfortunately, even with the best current vaccines available, persons with immune compromising conditions do not achieve the same level of vaccine protection as persons who have normally functioning immune systems. Many people in our society do not understand their own or their family's risk from infection by vaccine preventable diseases. Few of our patients and families have seen measles, have seen polio, have seen tetanus, and not all recognize the ongoing risk from other common vaccine preventable diseases, including influenza and COVID-19. Adding this misperception of risk to ongoing and widespread anti-vaccine misinformation places many at unnecessary risk. Next slide, please. This slide provides just a few snapshots of some recent vaccine coverage date rates. The panel to the left shows individual state rates for measles, mumps, and rubella vaccination in kindergartners, and the potential to achieve coverage which will minimize risk for outbreaks of measles, which is the most contagious of vaccine preventable diseases. It also brings out the point that many states allow exemptions from childhood immunization requirements. These exemptions place children and families, particularly those who cannot receive these vaccines, like our immune compromised patients, at risk. The upper panel on the right shows vaccination coverage rates for a number of adult vaccines in the eight years prior to the pandemic. These rates remain below our goals, and the lower panels on the right show disparities in vaccination rates, first by race and ethnicity, and then by household income. I've shown these to emphasize the fact that we continue to have preventable gaps in vaccination coverage, which adversely impact the lives of our communities. Next slide, please. In addition to the disease and disease prevention benefits of vaccines, vaccination has tremendous economic impacts on our society. I've included four references for you to demonstrate this. First, an economic analysis published in Health Affairs estimated the economic burden of vaccine preventable disease in adults at approximately $9 billion per year in 2015 dollars, with 7.1 billion of that cost being the cost of care for unvaccinated individuals. This could be turned into cost savings with increased adult vaccination coverage. Second, 
CDC data for cohorts of children born from 1994 to 2018 estimated an aggregate of 406 billion in direct cost savings and 1.9 trillion in social cost savings as a result of childhood vaccination. And the final two references provide a snapshot of the cost of management of outbreaks of pertussis and measles, vaccine preventable diseases for which we have safe and effective vaccines. Next slide, please. Beyond the reduction in severe disease, infection and transmission of vaccine preventable diseases, vaccines have been demonstrated to have a number of additional benefits. Measles, COVID-19 and influenza infections have all been shown to impair immune function in persons who survive the acute infection, and this leaves the survivors at risk for subsequent bacterial and viral infections, which may cause ongoing illness. Influenza, pneumonia, shingles, and COVID-19 infections all cause strokes, and influenza increases the risk for the development of Alzheimer's and dementia. Vaccinations reduce the risk for these adverse outcomes of infection. We're all concerned about the post-acute sequela of COVID-19 or long COVID, and a great deal of research is ongoing to better understand this spate of complications of COVID-19 infections. But many may not know that a prolonged syndrome of decreased function, mobility, and cognitive dysfunction is not uncommon in seniors following influenza. Both of these phenomena are preventable by vaccination. Hepatitis B and HPV vaccines, as Dr. Kochar has mentioned, are underused in our society. These vaccines are critical tools to reduce the risk for associated cancers. In countries like Australia, where HPV vaccination has been much more broadly accepted, rates of HPV-associated cancers are declining rapidly, and we're starting to see some declines in the United States now. Next slide, please. Our current vaccines are useful tools to prevent and mitigate the severity of disease, but we have the potential to improve on our current vaccines. It's not uncommon to see reports in the media of low effectiveness of influenza vaccines and how protection from infection declines within months of COVID-19 vaccines. It's far less often reported these vaccines have saved many, many American lives. Ongoing research has the potential to lead to more effective vaccines against influenza and COVID. And the development of alternative delivery systems, such as uh, needle-free patches, may lead us to vaccinate without even requiring an injection. These advances could result in even greater individual and societal benefits. We've seen a glimpse into the possibility for these steps forward by following the story from the first generation of pneumococcal vaccines to the current generation of potent conjugate pneumococcal vaccines, all to say that research to develop better vaccines and vaccine-related technologies are an investment in our future. Next slide, please. The declines in routine vaccinations and the low uptake of COVID-19 vaccines in many parts of our country are a precautionary tale, which has resulted in outbreaks of polio and measles in communities with low vaccination rates and other less appreciated impacts including RSV outbreaks outside the usual seasonal pattern, an early and severe influenza season in 2022-23, and continued COVID infections and deaths across the U.S. Now over 103 million cases, and with over a million cases in my home state of Arkansas, and over 1.1 million deaths in the U.S. Why did these vaccine declines occur? Many factors have been cited, including pandemic-related closures leading to decreased access to routine vaccinations, social disruptions contributing to decreases in vaccine confidence and an increase in vaccine hesitance, the explosion of anti-science claims and misinformation on social media, and the embrace and spread of these claims by influencers and some with the eye of the media. Next slide, please. To close, I want to emphasize three points. First, immunization against vaccine-preventable diseases remains critical for the health and safety of our society. Not only do we need to return to higher levels of coverage, we need to redouble our efforts to eliminate disparities. We need a, what I would term, a vaccination for all Americans program. Second, the anti-science movement is a threat to all of our health. We need to call out and label it misinformation for what it is, to provide better education to our young people in critical thinking and how to replace the false narratives with the true impact of vaccines and science to the benefit of our society. And third, ongoing investment in the vaccine enterprise is critical. 
to close gaps, to support worldwide partnerships to identify outbreaks and to respond rapidly, and to develop new and better vaccines and vaccine-related technologies. I want to thank you again for your time and attention. I'm now happy to turn the podium over to Dr. Buonotti. Thank you very much, Dr. Hopkins, for that great presentation. Hello, everybody. Um, it's my pleasure to speak to you today. Um, I would like to talk about low and unequal adult vaccine coverage in the US and how it can be addressed. Next slide, please. So I'm gonna talk about the importance of adult vaccination and we'll look at adult vaccination coverage in the US, barriers to adult vaccination and then strategies to increase adult vaccination and I will talk to you. Next slide. Thanks to Dr. Co-Chair and Noah, Dr. Hopkins for already establishing the importance of vaccinations uh, in, their, in their presentation. It suffice to say that we know from strong data that vaccines provide um, significant health, social, economic, and natural security benefits for individuals and for the society at large. Currently in the US, um, the ACIP recommends um, age and condition specific vaccines for adults 19 years and above. And these vaccines actually protect against 15 diseases. And the specific recommendations go beyond that for adult, for the general adult population. There are also recommendations for healthcare providers such as the hepatitis B vaccination, which um, has been shown to provide not just benefit to the patients, but also to health providers, colleagues, and the communities at, at large. And for those who are traveling, there are um, recommended and recommended routine and required vaccinations for international travel that go beyond that, those that are recommended for the general population. For example, the yellow fever vaccination is recommended for those who are traveling to um, Africa or some countries in Asia. Next slide, please. While we know that vaccines have tremendous benefits um, and particularly adult vaccines, we, we also know that they are, American adults are inadequately vaccinated. There are only 22% of adults 19 years and, and older who have received all age appropriate vaccines. Recall that Dr. Koshia showed the different vaccines that are recommended by the CDC. Now, when you consider all those vaccines, um, recent data show that only 22% of, of um, American adults age 19 and above have received the right vaccines for their age and for their health conditions. And um, unfortunately, there are disparities by age, which was shown in Dr. Hawkins' um, presentation. If you look to, this, to the um, graph on the left, you would see that the bars are unequal. The pink bar, the pink bar to the left is um, the white population in America. The darker pink is the black population. The light pink is the Hispanic population. What you see here is that the coverage of um, adult vaccine amongst Black and Hispanic is the lowest, despite the fact that overall um, adult vaccine coverage is low in the US. And then on the right-hand side, the right bar shows you the age-specific um, vaccination rates. And you would see that for um, those who have received an um, influenza in the past 12 months, um, the youngest age group, 19 to 49, just less than 40% had received it in 2029. Um, the good thing is that the older adults who are more susceptible to um, the negative consequences of influenza have the highest rate, uh, but it's just still at 70%. So overall, we are not achieving the target vaccination coverage rates that are required in the US. Next slide. And another you know, important um, thing to note is that over time, we're, we're showing just little progress in um, vaccinating adults with, um, with the required vaccines. The only vaccine that has shown some improvement in the last decade is really um, herpes zoster vaccination, where 
it has increased from about um, from about 18% to about 30%, but still that's much lower than the target vaccination rate. So it's really concerning that we have inadequate protection against pneumococcal disease, influenza, hepatitis B, um, herpes zoster for adults in the US. And this means that tens of millions of Americans remain susceptible to the potential uh, deadly effects of vaccine preventable diseases. So why do we have no vaccination coverage in the US? There are supply side barriers and demand side barriers. So if we look at supply side, which has to do with how services are delivered, where services are delivered, who is delivering the services. We know that from the, the healthcare provider perspectives, there are some information gaps that actually prevent them from doing the best they can in terms of providing services. Some healthcare workers are not aware of the um, recommendations for adult vaccination. And granted, um, there are these recommendations are quite complex. They're a bit complex. They're not as straightforward as recommendations for childhood vaccination. And then the age differences are, you know, um, are different as well. So lack of awareness of the recommendation is one reason healthcare providers are not able to. Um, strongly recommend vaccination for their clients. Um, another thing has to do with them um, not knowing what the indications are or what the contraindications are, particularly with older adults who many times have concurrent illnesses. So not knowing which vaccine to recommend in the face of the concurrent illness might be a barrier. In terms of operational barriers, while providing services, um, research has shown that some healthcare workers do not screen their clients for their immunization status to understand which vaccines to recommend. And so that presents a missed opportunity for vaccination. And with the time crunch that healthcare providers face with addressing and attending to their patients, some of them are unable to provide the right communication that will convince their clients to take the vaccine after considering the benefits and the risk um, of the vaccination. And as, and as such, um, there, there is a lack of um, current and easily accessible medical records. So if um, vaccination records are not accessible, then client and um, providers may not know what vaccines to recommend to their clients. And then when we think about the system-wide issues, um, in some provider offices, they don't have enough storage um, facilities for some vaccines, particularly those with stringent storage um, requirements like life attenuated influenza. So that means that when clients come to them, they are unable to vaccinate them on site. And then sometimes they can face vaccine shortages, even though they are able to store vaccines in their, um, in their facilities. So this is particularly uh, striking with family physicians and internists where um, some of them are not able to stock all the routine vaccines that are recommended for adults. Next slide. Then from the client side, so from the um, population side, there are knowledge barriers, there are barriers around perceptions, and then there are practical barriers that preclude them from accessing vaccines even when these vaccines are there. So the first one has to do with knowledge. Many adults don't even know what vaccines are recommended for them. They don't know the, va the vaccines and they, therefore they don't know the benefits. In addition, they may not know what the schedules are. And, and then particularly for um, adults who have, um, who have no insurance, um, some of them don't know where to access free public vaccination programs. But by far, the most important um, knowledge barrier has to do with the lack of recommendation from healthcare providers. So when healthcare providers are proactive in recommending those vaccines, clients know about them and then they make a decision about taking the vaccines. Now, besides knowledge, perceptions and beliefs are important. Um, we know that childhood vaccination is a household name and most people know the importance of childhood vaccination, but they don't know the importance of adult vaccination. So it's 
it's not a priority. So you would see that in, in schools, they make um, vaccination um, required or providing the vaccination card required for children, but that's not done in the workplace. And that boils down really to the lack of priority given to adult vaccination. And then we have to deal with myths and misconceptions and misinformation. A lot of that has really come with the COVID vaccination. That has led to fear of side effects um, of the vaccines. And some people just, it's just a simple matter of fearing needles. So it's good that there are new technologies for needleless vaccination that may help address the fears of people like that. And Dr. Hopkins have talked about distrust. So distrust in the health system, in the healthcare provider, or in the government and in the vaccines themselves have shown to be a strong driver of um, um, hesitancy to vaccination. And then the work of the um, anti-vaccine um, groups has really exacerbated these concerns and distrust about vaccines. And then finally, I want to talk about practical barriers uh, that um, individuals might face accessing um, um, vaccination. So distance to vaccination sites is a problem to some people. Language literacy barriers might be a problem. So because of language um, barriers, they are unable to schedule uh, vaccination um, appointments. And then the direct cost of vaccination will be a barrier to low-income families who are uninsured. Transportation costs, believe it or not, is also a problem. And then for older adults who have mobility difficulties, they may not have somebody who can help them to go get vaccinated, and that would be a problem. And then this issue of records, incomplete vaccination records, can also be a barrier. And then for working um, adults, being able to take time out of work or to have childcare uh, to get vaccinated can be a barrier to them accessing um, services. Next slide. So what are the interventions that have been shown to improve adult vaccination in the US? There are several interventions and I'll group them into three. So things that would enhance the provider action, things that would improve access, and then things that would raise vaccine demand and uptake. So from the provider side, um, if there, there should be actions or in, um, activities or even um, processes that put in place um, effort to routinize patient reminders. So for the provider, if you have standing orders or protocols or, or job aids that would remind them to recommend vaccines to their clients and also to remind their clients when it's time for their vaccinations or for their booster doses. The use of electronic medical records and vaccination registries have been shown to improve um, provider action to either remind or recommend vaccination. Um, and then for providers who don't have vaccines on site, um, making a strong referral to their clients for vaccination to centers that can provide that service has been shown to also increase vaccination uptake. And then there, are, there is the issue of um, promoting the use of uh, the NVAC standards for adult immunization practice. So when providers take on these standards and use them in their services, it's been shown to improve um, adult vaccine uptake. Now, in terms of improving service access, um, one, the first thing to do is really to make sure that there is enough services in the communities where people can access. So having pharmacies provide vaccinations has improved um, access as well as uptake, and then also having community vaccination sites. In the same vein, we can think about providing vaccinations in the work site so that it makes it easier for people to get vaccinated, particularly when it comes to outbreak response like we saw in COVID where vaccination uh, was provided in the workplace. And in terms of convenience, we, would, we could try to make vaccinations more convenient for adults by holding it at times that work for them. We will also, through policy and regulation, uh, try to reduce patient out-of-pocket expenditure for vaccination. So that financing um, ceases to be a barrier for them. And to do this, there has been recommendations that federal funding for 
purchases of vaccines for uninsured um, adults should be made available. I, I believe the Congresswoman uh, mentioned um, a, a, a policy that she's pushing to make sure that funding is made available for adult vaccination, uh, especially for HPV uh, vaccination. And then some studies have shown that when you shift the payment model from fee-for-service to outcome-based um, payment, then providers go the extra mile to try to get their clients to get vaccinated. Now, on the demand side, some recommendations include um, implementing vaccine um, education programs in the community using trusted messengers, using people that look like the clients, using people that are trusted by the community. And then studies have also shown that providing financial incentives to improve vaccination uptake can, uh, can work. Next slide. So thinking about minorities and improving access to vaccines for minorities, I would just wanna highlight some different um, recommendations here in terms of improving confidence in the vaccine and then in terms of improving access to the vaccine. So the first thing is we know from, from work that's been done with um, especially black communities that the idea, the, the idea around systemic racism is one of the underscoring factors that lead to mistrust or distrust to both the vaccine and the establishment. So if you want to build confidence in vaccines, you have to first of all acknowledge that and then start from that point of acknowledgement, especially with trusted messengers and trusted community leaders, and then lead into building up trust that will then lead to vaccine acceptance. You have to develop the messages for the communities with the communities. So really building on co-creation approaches with, for example, human-centered approaches whereby you work with the communities themselves, like my colleague at IVAC did a project in Baltimore where she worked with Baltimore residents to create messages that address community concerns and needs. And these messages have to be transparent about what we know and what we don't know about vaccines. And they, 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 this co-creation approach is one that creates an opportunity for open dialogue between scientists healthcare providers and the, pop, and, the, and the community so that questions can be answered. And then on the access side, um, we need to really address the issue of lack, the debt of clinics and debt of primary healthcare providers in minority communities by adding more medical um, services there and then um, working with underserved communities to identify how best to serve them. We have to build on existing resources in the communities. We, there's a lot of resources in the communities through the churches, through the religious leaders, through youth groups, women's groups. We must build on these resources in order to reach the people with the messages that will change their minds. And then we have to think about not just the service provision, we have to think about the ancillary um, services that will enable people access services. Can we provide transportations to pick people from their homes and take them to vaccine for vaccination services? Can we think about how to help um, people who are not who are on the on the wrong side of the digital divide to be able to help them um, create appointments or schedule their appointments um, either by phone or to have people meet them and, uh, and help them schedule their appointments? Then we have to finally talk about the authenticity of partnerships that we build in the community. COVID has taught us that we need to work with the communities. Even though we know we need to work with the communities, that relationship, that partnership has to be authentic. It has to come from a place of wanting to do good, of wanting to build and wanting to help the community. So these are the things that we need to do to build trust in um, disadvantaged communities in order to um, gain um, you know, access and have them improve uptake. And then finally, the last slide. So I want to conclude by saying that we know that adult vaccination provides tremendous health, social, economic, and national security benefits when you think that you know, vaccines, um, infectious diseases, no, no border. 
Unfortunately, only about one in five adults, um, 19 years or older in the US, is up to date with their age appropriate vaccination. So while adult vaccination rates are low overall, it's even sobering, more sobering to note that there are racial disparities in vaccination uptake. So the problem is worse with Blacks and Hispanics, um, and they have lower rates than whites and, and other um, races and ethnicities in the US. Overall, there's been slow progress in improving adult vaccination rates in the US in the last decade. And consequently, tens of millions of Americans remain susceptible to deadly vaccine preventable infections. The barriers to vaccination range from information barriers by health care providers, operational barriers, systemic challenges. And from the client end, it's all around knowledge barriers, perceptions and beliefs, as well as practical barriers. But there are promising practices that have been shown to work. And these include enhancing provider action, improving service access, and raising demand and uptake through community sensitive vaccination education programs. So we need stronger policies, we need stronger funding action in order to facilitate the use of these promising practices to scale them up and improve adult vaccination in the US. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Wanobi, and thank you, Dr. Hopkins and Kochar. Incredible presentations, incredible detail that we are all trying to absorb. Uh, and I know we are uh, close to time, but I do want to ask a couple of questions. Um, and I think that many of us are pondering how we, you know, how do we better communicate the science and you know, how do we improve and repair the trust with the public to increase our vaccination rates for all? It really comes. I guess I'm sort of going to combine a couple of questions and sort of the strategies of how to work to increase compliance when it seems as though the healthcare practitioners may not be having the conversations that they need to have. And so I'm going to uh, perhaps Dr. Winodi, you want to take that first, but then I would love to hear from Dr. Hopkins and Dr. Kochar as well. Okay, sure. Thank you. So from the provider side, I think I mentioned that in my presentation. Um, providers are human beings, they can forget. So the best thing to do is really to give them job aids, things that will remind them to make those strong, strong recommendations to their, to their clients. So it might just be a checklist that is there with them when they're consulting with, with adult clients. And that needs to happen with all adults. So as soon as somebody comes in through the door, um, you can see from the slide that Dr. Kocher shared, that there are vaccines recommended for um, individuals from age 19 upwards. So any adult that comes in through should be screened to see if they have received the appropriate vaccine. And so that's one thing. Then in terms of building trust, you have to work with the communities to regain that trust. That's what my uh, colleague, um, Privodom, who did some work in Baltimore showed that working with um, religious leaders, particularly in the Black community, has been shown to be very effective. So you need to identify those people in the communities that are trusted, that have a voice, and that can be a champion, a voice for vaccination. And so the, the, the health department needs to go move beyond its comfort zone and work with non-traditional partners in order to build this trust, because this is trust that was disseminated over decades, and it will not be rebuilt in one day. Thank you. I, I have to add on to that, Dr. Winodi. You know, building these partnerships is a longitudinal process. We can't break down barriers that have developed over 20, 50, 100 years in a week. So building partnerships in a longitudinal way between our healthcare community, between our health, our community leaders, our faith leaders, uh, team-based immunization in the in the practice, where everybody from the front desk to the medical assistant to the to the physician or nurse are all giving the same message. We're all asking about, can I give you your influenza vaccine today? Dr. Hopkins wants you to have it to keep you from being sick this one. 
you know, and having an information system where all of those vaccines drop into a registry where I, as the physician, can see it, the pharmacist can see it, the public health agency can see it. Those are those are the key points in my view. Uh, and to add to that, so healthcare workers must be up to date with their own vaccines. We know that recommendations from healthcare workers uh, is the you know one of the uh, the criteria which really uh, influence uh, people getting the vaccines. So having clear cut recommendations from healthcare workers, no jargon being used, the risks and benefits being presented very clearly, using consistent denominators, visual aids. Uh, focusing on absolute numbers and not relative risk of percentages. And there are a number of tools available. You know, we've got job aids, we've got slide sets, we've got messages which can be prepared in advance, but then they have to be adapted to the, uh, you know, the person sitting across the table from you. Uh, and you know, it really has to be a, a two-way communication. Uh, it cannot just be healthcare workers speaking to the people, but really understanding their concerns and addressing them goes a long way in addressing vaccine hesitancy. Over. Thank you all. Unfortunately, we have run out of time and I have a list of questions that have come in through the chat and I apologize that we are not gonna to get to them. But I wanna thank all of our panelists for their wonderful presentations and taking the time today to educate all of us on adult vaccines and the impact that they have on our health and the society as a whole. I also wanna thank all of you who have participated with us today to learn about the importance of and how to navigate adult vaccines. Thank you to Merck for their support of the discussion around this important topic. As a reminder, we will be sending the recording of the program to all who registered today. So look for that in your inbox and thank you all. Have a great day. Thank you, goodbye. <laughs>